Really appreciate it. This meeting is being recorded. So nice to meet you all. As um, my name is Keith McClellan, I'm the Director of Partner Solutions Engineering here at Cockroach Labs. And I'm joined by my friend and, and frequent uh, 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 par uh, project uh, partner, Raphael Spazzoli. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick, Raphael? Sure. Raphael Spazzoli. Um, I work at Red Hat in consulting, um, architect um, in around everything around OpenShift, uh, both application and infrastructure. And it's a pleasure to be here with you, Kiss. Awesome. Well, you know that we're big fans of, of what Red Hat does in the Kubernetes community and, and glad to have you here today. So what we're going to be talking about today is a presentation based on a, a blog that I wrote, I guess, earlier this year around whether or not Kubernetes is kind of the next fault domain. And the argument that I'm making is largely that Kubernetes has become the, the common operating system for, for the cloud, for hybrid cloud deployments, multi-cloud deployments, multi-region deployments, anything where you need to be able to run a lot of the copies of the same application across multiple sites and maybe route users uh, to them the is is a is largely getting run on kubernetes these days um and in my opinion kubernetes meets all of the criteria for an operating system right it manages work and runtime right it manages the resources without explu explicit user interaction like when was the last time you picked which cpu core on your macbook was was running your application you don't do that it's because the operating system handles that for you um, it's got a common input and output layer. So as a as an application developer, or as an administrator, or as a user, I interact with a common API gateway and the system handles all of this for me and it abstracts away the complexity of running an application across a cluster of machines, right? So the, the thing that Kubernetes, that's special about Kubernetes is really that that operating system isn't limited to a single machine. Not only does that open up some challenges to running an app across nodes in Kubernetes, but it opens up this concept of having to build apps that not run not just across servers, but across Kubernetes clusters. Effectively, your Kubernetes cluster becomes your fault domain for building your application, for building highly resilient applications. Now, the reality is there's a lot of multi-cluster challenges in Kubernetes. Some of them have been solved today. Some of them haven't, right? Um, there's challenges around networking. There's challenges around load balancing and service discovery, identity and trust. So like with networking, we're talking things like there's, there's CNIs, there's eBPF, there's VPNs. There's these things called VANs or virtual application networks. For load balancing, you've got concepts like API gateways and service meshes for security there um, you, you have to have a consistent view of what a user is allowed to do in multiple different locations that's a really challenging problem identity and trust <clears throat> it, it, this is really how do I validate that the a user is who I, who they say they are right to try to avoid situations where um, a user that's working in one Kubernetes cluster isn't also, um, someone isn't trying to pretend they're them in another cluster and, and do bad things. Um, there's of course infrastructure and performance challenges. Uh, there's this whole concept of how do you manage failure recovery, uh, observability, monitoring, and then of course, you know, state, which is some one of the problems that CockroachDB can help with. Raphael, you've built a lot of these applications over the years. Where do you see some of the biggest challenges in building kind of multi-cluster applications on top of Kubernetes? Yeah, one place where I had significant challenges is the fact that Kubernetes operators are cluster bound. So they can control, they can automate and control everything inside the cluster. But when you go multi-cluster and multi-region, it's not that obvious how you can declare your intention as a user with something that impacts multiple clusters. You have to come up with some um, some solutions that is not, unfortunately, that is not 
just limited to writing an operator. That doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> Other things that that um, I had to deal with is trust and identity is, is an important one that you have here uh, because in Kubernetes there are Kubernetes is also it's not just a failure domain in my opinion it's all a trust domain it's very easy to validate that a pod is a pod and you know pod that is trying to connect to another pod is actually what it's saying it is it's easy to generate certificate within a cluster but when you have to connect with between multiple clusters uh, how do you how do you create that trust is is a problem that you have to solve um, and then another one is unavoidable but still something to consider that is is latency right that's not really just a problem of kubernetes it's a problem of it's just the way it works when you do deployment across multiple regions, but latency will impact um, several decisions. So you have to take that into account. Yeah, I, I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about latency at Cockroach DB, right? Um, we've got a bunch of optimizations to make the read path super fast, but um, we do, if we're in a multi-site configuration, we, we largely are always going to be impacted on the right side. Um, when we're writing to multiple regions, we've got to wait until a quorum of them are, are updated. I'll, I'll, re, I'll uh, double down on your operator comment. It's, we have an operator for CockroachDB, but it is on, it only works for single site deployments, right? For customers who want to use CockroachDB across multiple physical Kubernetes clusters, we recommend other install patterns that uh, that allow the administrator to, to be more explicit in making decisions. The last thing we want to do is have like a, a con API controller effectively that is making decisions based on incomplete information about the cluster, right? What we've talked about what we could maybe do to solve that problem in the future. Um, I know that the Kubernetes ecosystem and there's like Kube Federated and Kube multi-cluster, there are a couple of SIGs that they are trying to find different ways to tackle this problem. Um, I know this is something that the community has been talking about for a long time. Um, we have the advantage of theoretically, we could bootstrap this with our own database if we wanted to, but we haven't, we haven't gone down that path yet. Um, I know we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the failure recovery mechanisms here uh, a little bit later, but I'd love to dig in a little bit on the networking, right? So. Because there are a lot of different options here. There's kind of the CN, uh, CNI layer stuff, eBPF, right? Um, uh, there's there's also VPN-based solutions like Submariner that we've talked about in the past, and and then vans like Scupper. What what do you think is going to be the long-term solution for multi-cluster networking in mm -hmm. in Kubernetes? Yeah. <clears throat> So, so the premise here is that obviously when you deploy these solutions across multiple clusters, they need to communicate, right? And uh, I call that kind of a communication east-west communication as opposed to north-south, where, where you know that that where, which is the traffic that comes into the cluster and it's your workload. Here we're talking about the the workload issues having to communicate with each other. So for east-west. Um, across clusters and across possibly you know data centers and re cloud regions there are some solutions i think that uh, that you have mentioned i think i um i think that ebpf has, has a good chance of of becoming the the preferable one um i th i think that Cilium already has a solution in this space um but in general i see that that's, uh, that could be a, a good technology to build this east-west tunnel tunnels between uh, between clusters. There is enough abstraction there where you know it, it, you could make it at the same time very efficient and and abstract a lot of the com underlying complexity that you may find when you do this setup. So. As an extension of that, right, mm -hmm. there are definitely circumstances where uh, 
pods in one Kubernetes cluster need to be able to discover pods in another Kubernetes uh, cluster, either for high availability purposes or potentially just for synchronization purposes. So what do you kind of see as the state of the art for like multi-cluster load balancing service discovery? Are you like a service mesh fan? Are you an API gateway fan? Do you prefer like the CDN style approach where, um, where you have set kind of like a global load balancer? Like what's your, what's your philosophy there? My hope is that uh, it, there is a specification for multi-clusters, multi-cluster services. I think it's called MCS within the Kubernetes, one of the Kubernetes SIG. That's, that's a specification that works well for tunnels between, SDN tunnels between clusters, where you don't need to involve egress and ingress to do that. My hope is that we can um, we can uh, you know standardize around that kind of approach, uh, possibly that kind of specification. Um, the other, yeah, um, the multi-cluster service mesh is another option here, but um, there's no need to have the overhead of the sidecar, you know, for for just for discovery and and uh, load balancing. Yeah. Um, I will mention. Um, cause I forgot to, at the beginning of the, of the call, we are, um, we are accepting questions in the Q and a, and, uh, we will be raffling off some t-shirts too. I think it's the five best questions that get asked. So, um, if anyone has questions, it, please drop them in the webinar chat. I'd be happy to, we'll we'd be happy to try to field them live or, um, any that aren't completely on topic for what we're we're talking about at the moment, but are related. We'd be happy to, to get to at the end of uh, end of the the webinar. Before before we move on, Raphael, are there other multi cluster challenges that we're not talking about here? Something I missed, maybe. I think it's a complete list. At least for, as far as I can tell, the the monitoring and observability is is a big one, right? It's. Um, yeah, collecting collecting um, those metrics across multiple clusters. It, it's not only, it does, you know, you, you, you need to have something else where that uses a collector and then you have to solve the scalability problem. And it's often, you know, as, as you are more and more successful, it, it can become a, an issue and uh, it can become an, a bottleneck. I think, I think we're seeing a lot of evolution in that space and the open telemetry standardization, it's, it's a very good thing. I know this is a thing that we had to build into CockroachDB was um, kind of monitoring capabilities for cluster-wide monitoring capabilities so that we could see what any given node's opinion was of the health of the rest of the cluster to help us diagnose these types of issues. But that's a single, like, that's a specific implementation. Do you see... Do you see any common patterns emerging around how how we're going to do this in the kind of a multi Kubernetes cluster world across arbitrary applications? Yeah, no. The pattern is to you know produce the, the metrics and the traces and collect them towards a common collector. Maybe applying sampling if if need be. But I see. And and so things solution like Tanox, Tanos and um, I don't remember the other Cortex, right? Those two are good are good approaches. Um, but I see what in the actual implementation phase, I see a lot of uh, struggle within my customers in in achieving the correct level of scalability, scale, I should say, the correct level of scale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just. Distributed state management in general is challenging, right? We've solved it for, for kind of relational transactional workloads, but on an arbitrary basis, there are a lot of different solutions that are out there and they all have their their strengths and weaknesses. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later here in the, in the chat. Um, but I imagine that observability and monitoring has both that challenge plus kind of the single pane of glass challenge, right? Where... 
I need to, I care about the, the health of my application. Um, not necessarily the health of a given Kubernetes right. pod or cl even a cluster in a multi-cluster world. Um, and I certainly care about when users have a degraded experience because they're being routed to a more remote loca remote location than, than they necessarily need to be. Um, so there, we do have a, a question in the, in the, the Q and a, uh, what's the solution to have geo redundant, redundant Kubernetes clusters that are hosted on-prem, right? Um, I will say that in general, the, the customers that that I've worked with that had kind of either an on-prem or hybrid cloud deployment, um, most of them ended up using OpenShift, right? Um, the I think the important thing with on-prem clusters is, at least from a CockroachDB perspective, is making sure that you have similar performance characteristics out of all of your different sites and you have reliable connectivity between those sites. Those seem to be the most important things for CockroachDB. Raphael, you've built more hybrid application stacks than I have. Is there any, um, is there anything else that you'd have to add on top of that? Yeah, I, um, I think, uh, I don't see a lot of dif difference between the cloud and on-prem um, in terms of building, you know, geographical distributed uh, solutions. But I would say just the way the, f the question is phrased, um, we look for solution to our applications, you know, availability, not necessarily to the cluster availability. I would say it's more important to think about the application than the cluster let's treat the clusters as disposable. Um, so at that point, it doesn't really matter where they run. Uh, it only matters that you can, once some the disaster happens or some problem, you have some problem, you can bring them back, right? And you can reapply quickly the configuration possibly with GitOps. And then we can focus on making the applications available, you know, and resilient to a disaster. Um, so, Rephrasing the question, what is the solution to making application available um, and especially stateful application when you want to deploy this application across multiple cluster, possibly hybrid or you know multiple on-prem geography? I think we're gonna go down a little bit deeper in, into that question in the rest of the presentation. So so um, we got we got one more question that I, I'm going to field while we're we're on this topic, which is around upgrading uh, cross cluster applications to a newer version. So with CockroachDB, we um, we support this out of the box, and in a multi cluster deployment, we generally recommend you upgrade one region at a time. Um, now CockroachDB can uh, roll pods and continue to have the service live, um, even in the region that's being upgraded. And the database is designed to be able to support running in kind of a mixed version mode during an upgrade. So we can do that without an outage. Um, my experience largely is if you solve that from a data layer perspective, the, the application services end up being pretty easy to upgrade. Um, the... Uh, the challenge uh, is usually at the data layer when you have to like make schema changes or some other sort of data migration. Um, and CockroachDB was designed out of the box to solve that problem. Uh, Raphael, do, have you experienced any other kinds of challenges with that type of uh, pattern? No, I, I agree with you. <laughs> it's interesting. I'm in the middle of those kind of discussion with a customer, but yes, I, I would... Yeah, I take care of doing the schema changes and the database upgrades first. And then the stateless piece of the application, it's way easier to deal with. So I'm gonna kind of summarize my, my take on this, right? In Kubernetes in general, but particularly in multi-cluster Kubernetes, it's important to design your application stack to survive when failures happen rather than to have kind of a disaster recovery strategy, which was the traditional way of handling applications. Um, 
And, and that largely means we need to rethink how we build systems. We need to plan for the system continue to operate when something's broken rather than uh, planning to try to recover from a uh, outage when something's broken. And, and largely the reason for this is in a sufficiently distributed system, something's always broken. Um, <laughs> You know, you're running hundreds of thousands of pods for microservices. You're running, say, 150 nodes of CockroachDB across three sites, maybe. Um, the likelihood that you don't have some problem somewhere in your environment at any given time is, is pretty close to zero. So it becomes imperative to design the system to kind of be able to handle the, the types of events that used to be considered a disaster. Now, Raphael, I know you're an expert in the in how how to build systems to survive disasters in Kubernetes. So, uh, do you want to kind of lead this part of the conversation? Sure. Thank you, Keith. Um, so, this uh, table is uh, from a, a white paper that we wrote for the CNCF tag storage that talks about this idea of cloud native disaster recovery. I'm gonna to try to talk about it in, in con comparing and contrasting it with traditional disaster recovery. So in, in traditional disaster recovery, the detection uh, of the disaster is usually a human decision, right? So something starts to go wrong, there is a meeting, the decision is made that we cannot recover with the usual, you know, HA type of approaches, somebody press a big red presses a big red button, and we are now in DR mode, right? Then, then there are then a lot of stuff usually needs to happen. Some of it is automated, some not, but it's usually a manual decision. In, in cloud native disaster recovery, we want to or disaster management, we want to um, we want that decision to be made by the system. So the system autonomously realizes that a piece of it is not responding anymore and uh, takes action. And then the recovery procedure itself, like I said, usually what we see you know, in large organization is um, uh, a mix of automated and, and manual actions. And that's the reason why you know, there is this biannual, uh, biannual um, you know, disaster recovery exercise in, in some places. And sometimes it's well done, sometimes it's not, not so well done, but um, it's, there is manual action. There, is, uh, there are actions that are not commonly executed that people you know, are not used to, they may fail. Why are they doing, why they do, that, do them? In cloud native disaster recovery, everything needs to be fully automated. So the machine makes the decision to, that something needs to be done because there is a failure and that the actions that we take are fully automated. Then RTO and RPO are uh, the two main disaster recovery metrics, right? One is RTO is the time that it takes to recover the service. RPO is the elapse of data that we lose because of the disaster. So in, in, in traditional disaster recovery, depending how, how you architect the system, you could be between minutes and hours of uh, downtime, right? In cloud native disaster recovery, we we want to be near zero uh, downtime. Essentially, the time that it takes for an L check to take place and de detect that there is uh, something going wrong and start redirecting the traffic to the healthy locations. And for a recovery point objective RPO, in traditional disaster recovery, you can have from, from zero to hours, depending on the storage solution that you use, Right. If it's backups, it's probably hours. If, it, if it's more of a synchronous uh, file um, or volume synchronization, it's probably it could be around zero. But for cloud native um, disaster recovery, disaster management, it, it can be zero, especially if we are talking about strongly consistent solutions, which um, you know, Cockroach is one of them. And then now, um, thinking about the ownership of these processes, right? The disaster recovery processes. So a little bit out of the te technology, more about the organizational aspects. Normally, 
um, in in large in large organization, um, the the ownership of the business continuity of, of an application is always in the application team. But normally, what happens is that the application team team turns to the storage team or the infrastructure team and says, "What guarantees can me, can you give me for this database or for this uh, volume?" Right and and then they take whatever the answer is, whatever is available in the, in the organization. Sometimes there are tiers, but essentially that the very limited choice. My argument is that in planetary disaster recovery, because the, the, the responsibility of owning the disaster recovery process is going to be in the, in the team and, and because they will have to choose the correct middleware and they will be the owner of the middleware. So. In, so it could be CockroachDB or it could be ETCD or it could be Kafka, but they are going to own it or maybe they're going to purchase it as a service, and, but still essentially they are the owner. Um, and then the other thing that I noticed doing this kind of deployments and this kind of exercise is that in traditional disaster recovery, the actual technical capabilities that essentially enable the ability to recover it's so the disaster recovery procedure are backup uh, uh, log shipping or you know volume synchronization something that happens at the storage layer uh, instead in in cloud native disaster recovery we need more capability from the networking layer in particular we need that east to west communication that we were mentioning before and we need a good load balancer, global load balancer that can detect um, issues and, and can make a decision about how to steer the traffic. Yeah, so so we have a question in the chat about whether or not backup is still an option for, for very large um, environments. Uh, specifically, I think the question is around data. Um, at least with CockroachDB, the answer is yes. Um, we, we do distributed backup to each location so so that you, we can solve for that problem i think in general the 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 question really then becomes how fast can you get those backups off site right um so so with cockroach db the data is replicated to multiple regions so even if you lose a single region you still have a full copy of the data backed up in another region but for regulatory reasons sometimes you do need to have a like a tertiary storage location for, for that type of stuff. Um, so is it an option? Yes, but it does. If you end up having to go to that, it looks a lot more like a traditional DR type of a solution where it takes hours to get the data backloaded potentially, um, which is why largely we architect these solutions to survive what would traditionally would be a disaster and treat it as an HA event because the, because True disasters end up being incredibly expensive from like a human um, perspective. If it's a if it's a financial application or whatnot, it can have a monetary impact on the company. There, there's usually a lot of fallout to to having a true disaster happen. So anything we can do to avoid um, a disaster and treat, be able to treat as an HA event is, is usually best. The, the one thing that Raphael, you didn't mention that I'm going to, I'm going to mention is that 70% of disasters are either caused or exacerbated by the human interaction. Mm -hmm. One person doing one thing and in, in the wrong order, um, can, can turn, uh, set like a, a failover from say a couple of minute type of an event to a couple of hour or a couple of day type of event. Um, someone fat fingers a command, someone deletes the wrong file, somebody does something that they probably didn't even mean to do. It's not like there was necessarily even intent, but but uh, people are the most fragile element in, um, in disaster recovery. So the more you can remove the people, the less likely you are to have a disaster. So um, thank you for, for running with that, um, Raphael. Do you have any other context you'd like to add? Well, on, on backup, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, it comes up often. Uh, I would say we, if you if you can deploy a cloud native disaster solution, you know, 
whether with Caucus or other, um, other of these new generation of um, state distributed workloads, you, you probably still want to do backups, but not to protect yourself against a disaster. It's more to protect yourself against logical errors, right? Say, say you make a wrong deployment and you drop a table, you know, your code drops a table that was not supposed to be dropped. Now you still have a backup, right? So you have backups for those reasons, not for protecting you for, against disaster recovery, against disaster. There's always the chance that there will be a real disaster and you will need those backups. So it's good to have them. Um, you just actually answered one of the, the other Q and A questions about um, um, how do you account for replicating corruption? So in CockroachDB, um, the, the replication happens at the raft log layer and the actual file system work happens through a KV store. So, um, so you would, someone would have to have submitted bad data for us to have, um, have like file system corruption propagate to, towards multiple nodes. In CockroachDB, if the, if the node notices file system corruption, it will remove itself from the cluster. Um, and since all of the data is replicated at least three times, that will still leave us with a quorum of replicas to process against. And then after a handful of minutes, the cluster will take the two remaining good copies and, and create a new third clone from, um, and if you're really, really concerned about that, you can up replicate to five or seven uh, X replication to, for your most important data. Um, there, there was a kind of a follow-up question around uh, does storage level replication uh, make sense in a cloud native world? Um, or would you only rely on, on database level replication? For me personally, I'd like, uh, storage replication for some use cases in a single cluster perspective, but multi-cluster, there tends to not be enough data guarantees uh, to be assured of that consistency. So you're, I, I generally like either using some sort of a message bus like a Kafka to transport data between regions or a database like a durable state store, like a database to transport data uh, across a uh, across Kubernetes clusters rather than block or file system level replication, which um, doesn't necessarily guarantee that, um, that you'll have a replica that's consistent as of a point of time, but you're not guaranteed of what exactly that time is. And you won't be able to verify. There's no like transaction semantic to verify that the data has been updated, right? And so that's the more distrib distributed you get, the more likelihood that those types of um, um, issues will pop up. And so I, I generally recommend either a message bus based solution or a, a, like a, a database based solution. Raphael, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I agree. Uh, I don't see file level replication or um, um, block level replication as a something in, in cloud native, perhaps uh, block, object storage replication, right? That that's, uh, you know, if you have an object storage and behind the scene, it's it's replicating, it's doing things that- Yeah, I possible. guess that's a good point, right? For replicating backups offsite. So that you might use a solution like that to do to a tertiary location, right? Um, but that's not going to be live block storage. That's going to be file level replication, not block level replication anyway, right? right, right. Um, so isn't this as expensive, right? So in a traditional DR type of environment, you have one site that's your primary hot environment. It's processing all of your traffic and you have a second one that's either warm or cold. And by warm, I mean, maybe you're doing some non-business critical work in the secondary site, like running BI dashboards or something like that, um, or it's truly cold where it's just there to receive data and context from, from the, the hot site, right? And both sites have to be able to handle 100% of your production workload. So that means that you have to be provisioned at 2X minimum of everything, plus whatever added infrastructure you need to keep those, those two sites in sync. Um, and as Raphael mentioned, the, the failover and failback is expensive and risky. 
Um, even when the failover works really well, the failback actually is a lot of times even more risky than the failover because everybody only tests in one direction. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, Raphael, where the failover works great. And then they realize that they don't have any run books on how to fail back. You've been, have, yeah. have you lived that world before? I, I uh, yes, I, yeah. can, I can attest to that. Yes. Yeah. So um, when you started to talk about cloud native disaster recovery, um, all of your sites are supporting users are hot effectively. Um, and that, and that means when you lose a site, your remaining sites are, are there to support, uh, you distribute whatever work was on that site that failed to the remaining sites, which reduces your total overhead of operating the solution. So effectively in cloud native disaster recovery, you're gonna recommend three or more sites, right? That allows you to do consensus-based replication. It allows you to um, not have an external observer deciding when a, a disaster has happened, right? Um, at least with Cockroach DB, when you lose, if a site gets, say, has a network partition, the that the database knows to shut itself down if it can't see a quorum of the nodes in the cluster, so that you know that uh, business operations aren't continuing to be processed in that site, which is really important. Um, but the real key thing is the more distributed you are, and by more distributed, I mean across the more sites that you're distributed, the less overhead you have to survive any particular event, right? So if you're across three sites, you need to have 160% of your total infrastructure provisioned to be able to continue to, to run your production operations during a site failure. If you're at four sites, it's 35 to 45%, five sites, 25 to 35%. Et cetera, et cetera. At five sites, you could also potentially, if you wanted to design your system to survive two site failures concurrently, you could provision your infrastructure to do that as well. Now that would change your overhead numbers here, but now all of a sudden we're in the rarefied era of having to worry about multiple region, cloud regions going down simultaneously. And because there's no failover or failback, all you're doing is routing users to a different site. When those sites come back online, they just rejoin the cluster, get caught back up, and then start processing user transactions, right? Uh, CockroachDB makes this really, really easy. Um, we actually spent an enormous amount of time building the SQL engine to enable us to do that. Um, and the, the great thing about using Congress under the covers for problem to solve these types of problems is it gives the apps that are running on top of it those same superpowers, right? Um, so assuming that you're using um, either the database for all of your state or the database plus, say, a distributed message broker like a Kafka that also can survive these types of um, events, all of a sudden now you're in a situation where um, a site failure, say AWS US one goes down or Azure West two goes down or Google central one goes down. Um, you are still in uh, full operating mode. Maybe your performance isn't as good as it was when you had all of your sites up and running, but you're able to continue to process all of your important business logic. Um, there is one question in the chat that I want to um, talk to here around uh, what's my opinion for about data consistency in a multi-cluster environment. Personally, I think it's super important. I wouldn't be a cockroach to be if I didn't. It is kind of the problem we were designed to solve. Um, the one thing that I'll point out is that kind of traditional consistency requirements in either a single server or a single site are um, kind of are, have a limited window of vulnerability just based on the physics, right? A single server, when you're in a, like you're running a lower level of consistency, let's say you're running like snapshot or repeatable read in your database, or maybe running a non-POSIX compliant file system, right? Your vulnerability window to, um, to like data entropy problems is, is really small, right? On a single server, you're talking microseconds, and a multi-server, but single like physical site situation, you're probably talking still less than a millisecond of actual vulnerability window. As soon as you're multi-site, your best case vulnerability window is, uh, is one round trip between 
your site and its next near site, right? Which is a couple of orders of magnitude more vulnerable. Um, there are certain use cases that can tolerate that type of vulnerability. Um, and if you can, there are some great, like, NoSQL type solutions that, that can help you do state synchronization, right? Um, in those types of scenarios. But if you're dealing with anything that's like financial transactions, inventory management, anything that require uh, uh, transaction or uh, like accounting stuff, anything that requires any kind of auditable results, um, I think it's exceptionally important to, to think about this before even you get started if you can, right? Now, granted, CockroachDB being uh, Postgres while protocol, protocol compatible means that we can kind of come in after you've already built some of your app and, and help you get moved, but it's it's a little harder, right? So um, let's go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what this looks like with CockroachDB, right? So we do a lot of multi-cluster Kubernetes. Um, whether it is multi-region across a single cloud, multi-cloud provider, like I'm showing in this diagram, a hybrid, like a lot of the work that I've done with Raphael in the past, where you have some physical on-prem sites and you've added some cloud sites in, all of them basically have this same fundamental challenge, right? How do you manage um, an app that runs across um, multiple Kubernetes clusters? So on a single basis, Cockroach TV is actually really good at doing this on its own. Um, now for our um, dedicated and serverless offerings, our database of service offerings, where we're running fleets of systems that are running across multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters, we have built our own kind of control plane. Uh, I think we're using an EPB, EBPF based networking solution under the covers. And um, we've certainly kind of built our own um, identity and access management um, plugins for both the on the administrator side and on the app side, so that users can, you know, use the same credentials to log into the database, regardless of which node or which site they've logged into. Um, you know, we've had to try to solve a lot of the the distributed backup problems that we were talking about here, right? Um, the thing that I like the most about CockroachDB in general is um, the database doesn't care. Um, so the database works by when it when a node joins the cluster, it it announces its location in physical location in the hierarchy, and that allows the database to kind of self manage replicas to make sure that we're um, replicating the data as appropriately for both per the performance requirements of the application and the resiliency requirements that the administrator has put in place. By default, we're going to deploy data in the most resilient pattern possible. Um, and it also gives you a lot of flexibility on the network and um, as well as having workloads be um, hot in, in all of these sites, right? Um, Raphael and I didn't have time to get the the kind of the demo set up um, for today, but um, we have on uh, on a pretty regular basis have have done demonstrations of of just this thing, where um, where we'll set up Red Hat on all three of the cloud providers, um, or OpenShift on all three of the cloud providers, and then run a single CockroachDB cluster across it. Right? Um, there's we have a lot of options as far as as that goes. And one of the things I like the most about OpenShift is because it is not so tightly tied to a single cloud provider. Um, you can have a common Kubernetes uh, operating experience by using OpenShift as your Kubernetes distro in all of these locations. So what does the future look like? Um, I have started to already see the Kubernetes ecosystem converge around some of these solutions. Like I think eBPF, Raphael, I agree, is probably where we're going to land for, for a lot of the cross-cluster uh, network routing, the east-west network routing types of problems that we've been talking about. Um, there's some great kind of multi-cluster controllers and like cross-plane and kube multi-cluster that are very promising. You know, identity management with AuthZ and Spice, uh, SpiceDB, um, Keycloak. Like there are a lot of, of great 
pieces of future tech that some of which are usable in production today, like EVPF, some of which are still kind of in, in development. But um, what's your thought on what kind of, what's the next, what's the next thing up that needs to be solved in the community? I think uh, um, global load balancing is is the next is is a thing where maybe the gateway API can help, but um, I haven't really I, I still have to see a a solution that is not very cloud provider specific to declaratively say. I want this traffic to be load balanced to these three regions, these three cluster clusters, and this the pods deployed in these clusters. Right? Um, yeah, I, I, there is, as far as I know, and I could I could have missed some some steps, but as far as I know, there is no specification there. Uh, the, the the gateway API could probably support that semantic but I haven't seen any real implementation for doing it. Yeah. So that's important because the global load balancer, like, is, like we said, is not just a traffic load balancer at this point. To, you certainly need that, but it needs to be more. It needs to be something that realizes that something is going wrong and uh, steers the traffic. So it needs, I call it a smart global load balancer in the sense that also has the concept of health checks. Um, and possibly also as the concept of, of advanced uh, traffic load balancing policies, like when you're doing these things, you know, really geographically distributed, you probably want the clients that are closer to a location to be always redirected there, right? Can you configure that policy uh, or is it just random? Um, it, 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 we obviously need those those capabilities. I haven't seen something in 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 the Kubernetes area that really addresses. There are some attempts, but there is nothing, uh, in my opinion, that is mature that really addresses that problem. And I think we need to work on that. Yeah. So um, there were a couple of questions in the, the chat around how the data replication works in CockroachDB. So I'm going to take that real quick. Um, sure. We, um, yes, the replication happens in real time. So CockroachDB is split up in these things called ranges, each of which is its own raft group. And those are synchronously replicated. And so what, what happens is in say a 3X replication uh, configuration for a transaction to be uh, committed, um, a full quorum of those replicas have to be updated before the transaction is committed. Um, and then any remaining replicas are updated within what we call our closed timestamp window, which is, uh, I think by default, I think we have it set to 250 milliseconds. Um, so the data replication happens in real time. And then what we do on the read end is we distribute the authority to act to the raft leaders. Um, so the raft leader for any particular segment of a table or database can respond to read requests without having to do a quorum check. So that's how we kind of avoid some of the like the 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 worst the worst side effects of the uh, of the cross region latency. Um, so we had a couple other questions. We are um, uh, we are about out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and run through the last slide or two and then anyone that wants to stick around and uh, get a couple more questions answered, I'm happy to do that. So um, if you'd like to, to learn a little bit more about um, how to run Cockroach to be on Kubernetes, there are a lot of different options. Uh, you can go and, and check out our website. Um, I've got a bunch of blog posts on this topic. Raphael's got some bunch of blog posts on this topic. Some of them are ones we co-authored together. Um, and there's a lot of other great content on the Cockroach Labs website around all of this. Oh, press the wrong button. And um, for those of you who don't want to stick around for the Q and A, uh, thank you for joining. Um, so um, we, we do have a couple of other questions. Um, one is, what tool do you consider best to manage Kubernetes services? Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer here. Um, I know a lot of folks um, like Helm as a package manager, but that's a single cluster kind of a solution. 
Um, I'll tell you that most of our multi-cluster deployments outside of our um, outside of our dedicated and our deep databases service um, offerings are all running uh, basically like static stateful set configs. Um, they provide the most flexibility for when you're trying to deploy a, a single stateful app across a, like a multi-cluster type of deployment. Um, have you seen any good like like application abstractions application abstractions, Raphael? Um, I don't want to name um, tools, but I'm just saying in terms of approach, I would I strongly recommend to go with a GitOps approach, both you know both for day two configuration, which is usually okay, the cluster is up. How do I, do I want to configure it? And what operators I need to install it, those things, but also for tenants. So whoever, if you're doing multi-tenant cluster, whoever is the user of the cluster, make them use GitOps to configure what they need from the cluster. Don't, you know, so instead of accessing the cluster directly and creating objects there, set up a GitOps workflow for that. Um there was another question around how do you manage situations where maybe a Kubernetes cluster got deleted? I think that's also an answer for that, right? If you use GitOps, what? then you can, you can, uh, uh, you can kind of rehydrate your environments pretty quickly. Um, I, I like that as a, a pretty good general solution to that problem. Um, so one remaining question, um, is it easy to deploy a cluster application running across three AZs with it? it's it's easy to run an application across three AZs in a region? Challenges when you run um, active active across two or more regions. How does the combination of OpenShift and, and Cockroach to be help with this use case? Right. So, um, so from an OpenShift perspective, my, my the more distributed you are, the more important it is to have a common um, operating layer. Uh, across all of your sites. Most of my customers that tr are trying to do um, this type, solve this type of problem are all in some sort of either a hybrid or multi-cloud type of a solution, right? And so as soon as you've got multiple cloud providers or you've got an, like a combination of on-prem and cloud offerings, um, it, it's really hard to make an argument not to use OpenShift for that use case because the um, it, it, there is a, like an impedance mismatch when an operator, a human operator is moving between different Kubernetes distributions that you can just avoid by using OpenShift. Um, as far as, um, um, does it make sense to run Cockroach to be on top of OpenShift then in that scenario? Generally, that's what we would recommend, right? Um, are there use cases where you might want to run the database outside of Kubernetes? Sure. But um, in general, Kubernetes gives Cock CockroachDB superpowers because if we have a transient pod failure, those pods can then get started up on another node. And then the database is in a degraded state for a much shorter period of time, right? Um, can you make simulate making that work by installing it on on? VMs, yes, you can. You can write system D scripts that will try to try to restart the database and or restart the node if there's a problem and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you absolutely can, but you end up doing a lot of work to to make that happen. Um, there's some performance trade-offs, but we do have a pretty robust uh, Cockroach to be on Kubernetes performance tuning guide on the website. Um, largely, most of the overhead comes from the CNI layer, and there's always the option of of moving away from that if you need to. So, um, that was the last. Um, um, there, that was pretty much the last question. So, thank you everybody for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, Candice, do you wanna do you wanna close us out? Yes. Thank you so much, Keith and Raphael, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.